Before we had Cyberpunk 2077, we had Cybermage, a largely unknown title that still manages to be unique more than 25 years on. Cybermage is one of those games that I love to talk about, but I'm always shocked when no one seems to have heard of it. It is probably one of the most unique, memorable, and genre-defying games I have ever played. So far ahead of its time, I just can't fathom how it didn't receive more attention on release. Join me in discovering a beautifully crafted world that mixes fantasy and sci-fi in an FPS RPG adventure years ahead of its time. Cybermage Darklight Awakening was created by Origin and released in 1995. The game released in a strange time for PC games. After Doom, but before the more narratively driven games like Half-Life had taken hold of the FPS industry. This unfortunately led to Cybermage being dismissed by the industry as little more than a Doom clone shooter, and it sort of flew under the radar. This interpretation could not be further from the truth. Being an FPS is probably the least memorable part of this game. Outside of having a fully fleshed out arsenal of weapons, the game also featured a robust magic system, detailed story, RPG elements, vehicle sections, and more. Keep in mind, this released before even Quake, an FPS game which received far more acclaim but couldn't boast even a fraction of these features. Calling this game a simple FPS cheapens what this title was trying to achieve. We will talk about the story elements explaining the magic in this game shortly. However, the way magic works in this game, from a gameplay perspective, is interesting. Essentially, you start off with one basic attack spell and can gain more spells through either finding them as pickups or being hit by those spells directly. If you could survive the spell hitting you, you could take that knowledge into yourself. This made for a couple of neat risk-reward scenarios throughout the game, where you would try to get other magic-wielding enemies to hit you with their powers, while also trying not to die. In terms of RPG elements, outside the story, you're also able to level up in a sense. When you kill enemies, they drop their Mara, or spirit. This spirit will only exist for a short time before dissipating, but if you can get in and pick it up, you will either get a temporary or permanent boost to your health or mana. A basic system, but it has a significant effect on your stats. I started the game with about 40 health and mana, and ended the game with 900 health and 550 mana. Aside from bigger numbers giving you that dopamine hit, it also affected the gameplay. You couldn't just stay at a distance and snipe enemies, as this would mean forfeiting their Mara. It forced you to get in close and take risks for that power boost. I don't want to have too much more preamble here, as this is a game that needs to be experienced to be understood, so let's get into it. The game starts off with an impressive intro cinematic that transitions into an animated comic. Something you're going to notice in this game is that it plays like a comic book story. Anyhow, opening here, we see soldiers rampaging through a laboratory, blasting the workers without mercy. A dark figure arrives, clearly looking for something his troops have failed to find. We cut to a deep, dark part of the lab with our hero in a tube. We break out, proclaiming that we are reborn. There is an intro comic explaining how we got here, but the short version is we are injured and implanted with a dark light crystal, a stone that gives us our magic abilities. Sort of like a bargain bin Robocop. From here, the game starts right where the cinematic ended. We are outside our test tube with probably more questions than answers. Moving out of the room, we find ourselves in caverns inhabited by hostile giant slugs, a perfect target for our newly acquired dark light power. Soon enough, we are in an open cavern and a spectral figure in purple robes appears. This is the Earth Mother, a bit of an enigmatic figure in the game. She is described as a supernatural being that represents the good side of your new dark light abilities. She gives some exposition on your power and how it works. She explains that the power is called the Maratak Mang, 
with the Mara being the light and the Mang being the dark. She also introduces Necrom as your ultimate rival and manifestation of pure dark energy. This monologue is a bit of a slowdown to the action, but we now have a basic understanding of what's going on and a mission to complete. All great stuff, but none of it will matter if we can't escape the lab and grow our strength. So let's get moving. We make our way through the first of Necrom's troops. They are generally weak, but at this point in the game so are we, so we need to play very carefully. We find a video phone and talk with a surviving lab worker. We need to find them to escape the lab, but before that we take a secret path to our first Darklight artifact. This pyramid item gives us limited access to the spell, Psyfire. This is essentially a beefed up version of our normal attack, but as we can gain powers by being hit by them, we shoot ourselves with it to gain the power permanently. We won't use it too much yet, as the power cost is more than we can handle at our limited strength, but it becomes a staple before too long. Back on the main quest, we find a basic laser pistol. Not the most glamorous of guns, but it is solid for the early game until we build our strength back up. We blast our way through the labs to find the lab worker imprisoned. They give us a keycard and some direction to escape through the sewers. Before reaching the sewers, we clear through to a vehicle bay where we find our first vehicle section of the game. The room is packed with soldiers, and we are still weak from our rebirth, but we are in luck. One of the tanks is unmanned. We jump in and lay waste to the entire room. This is a short segment, but it introduces vehicles and even tank-on-tank -tank combat. Before long, we find ourselves in the sewers. This section gives us access to another power if we are clever. Through a deeper, optional section of the sewer, we can find a pack of mutant ghouls. Generally, these ghouls are unremarkable, but in this instance, they have the ability to cast Electrocism. This ability is a damage over time lightning spell. Super useful up until the end of the game. To get it, we need the strength to tank a hit. We barely make it out alive, but we are now equipped with a super powerful ability. From here, we raise some bridges, kill some more assorted mutants, and climb out of the sewers to the freedom of the streets above. Upon exiting the sewer, we are immediately set upon by two new enemies, Bettys and Gangers. Neither are really any threat, they are slow-moving and melee-only enemies, so we just obliterate them with our Darklight powers. Moving forward, we meet a friendly NPC, Rook. He looks exactly like the male enemies here, so I almost blow him away. Luckily I stopped myself. He really doesn't have much to say, so we just move on. This area is super open-ended. The only way out of the slums is through the arena, which holds a $2,000 entry fee. To raise that money, we decide the best course of action is to just break into people's homes and steal everything they own. It's okay though. What you aren't considering is the people we'll be robbing are extremely poor and downtrodden, so taking their money is fine. Anyhow, while raiding people's homes, we come across another denizen of the slums, the Mungo. These enemies are only seen in this level, but have a sort of cool backstory. See, the current arena champion is the original Mungo. All these other Mungos are just low quality clones. Now, I don't know if this description also applies to the humans in the slums as well. There is a big version of the female gangster, so it could be. It's sort of an interesting way to explain why all the enemies look the same though also raises the question of why are we cloning people specifically to stick them in a slum and live in poverty? Like, this is a dystopic future where people are ruled by corporations, and the gap between those who have and those who have not is massive. Why would the elite create an army of people who resent them? More questions I simply cannot answer. We also find a shotgun and a submachine gun on this map, both solid additions to the arsenal. Anyhow, we raise the money we need, get into the arena, and make short work of Mungo. By this point, I've killed like 50 of his clones, so I've become particularly adept at killing homeless mutants. We steal his axe, and before exiting the area, go and make some bets on the arena ourselves. Using save scumming tactics, we turn our $2,500 into three million. Maybe we can use it to raise the poor out of the slums. Nah, we're gonna use it to buy guns. Exiting the slums, we find ourselves in a service tunnel. A police officer here lets us know his comrades are being slaughtered by Necrom's forces, and instead of helping, he's hiding in a tunnel. What a cool guy. We move past him and are now in the biggest hub area of the game. We will be crisscrossing back through this area a few times before we're done with it. Our first stop is the automated weapon store. There is a somewhat ahead of its time economy in the city. We have a weapon store, armor store, and hospital. 
Oh, and there's a gambling station. But as I'm already a multi-millionaire, we ignore that part. At the gun store, we pick up a few new weapons. We get the fusion gun, a sort of pistol. It shoots moderately slow-moving projectiles that deal high damage. Solid, if unremarkable. Next is the heavy blaster machine gun, essentially a rapid fire explosive weapon. This is essentially your BFG weapon, able to deal ludicrous damage quickly. Ammo can be challenging to find later in the game, but as long as we are in the city, we can just buy more, so let's make use of it. Fully stocked, we go to work wiping out Necrom's forces in the area. The police cars specifically move at insane speeds, making them hard to take out. I feel like this might be a DOS box issue. I don't recall them being this fast when I played this game years ago. Either way, we destroy them with extreme prejudice. We bounce between some clubs, with the friendly stripper girls eventually giving us direction to talk to one of the club owners to get access to an airship of our own. We do so, and quickly find ourselves in our own flying car. The flying car is fun to drive, even coming equipped with dual laser blasters. We use it to pass the fence at Metacop HQ and make our way inside. Entering Metacop HQ, we find the place lousy with Necrom's troopers and the usurped Metacop robots. Our powers are coming along, but still underdeveloped, so we make heavy use of our shotgun. Blasting through, we free some police, who give us codes to free more police, who eventually give us the means to reprogram the AI on the Metacop robots and bring them onto our side. We get the bots on our side and use them in an assault on the entrenched troopers. It's a small battle, and I do like 90% of the work, but it's still sort of fun. We then come across the world's most unaware soldier, in a scene I found to be just hilarious. Transfer of all Sky Patrol remote functions completed, sir. Very well, Sergeant. We'll take control of the patrol ships from here. Now find Cat's lackey cyber agent. Yes, sir. He won't get past me, sir. I'll take care of him myself. To progress further, we need to get a jump jet to pass a toxic waste lake. The jump jet itself is located in a room that requires you to pass through a maze of deadly beasts the police were keeping for security purposes. I feel I must take a breath here and once again wonder if we're on the correct side of this conflict. This supposedly lawful police force is not only a toxic lake, but a kennel full of mutated monsters that serve only to tear people apart with their bare hands. Like, maybe it's good the Metacops have been overthrown. Just a thought. Anyhow, I make my way through the downright scary Geno kennels, get the jump jet, and complete a frankly infuriating platforming section with the jets. Here we find the most heavily fortified section of the station, with turrets, soldiers, and even a legion of doom, Necrom's heavily armored special forces. We kill him sort of cheaply through a window, we miss out on his Mara, but get to take possession of his rocket launcher. Once the area is clear, we release the remaining Metacops and head back into the city. Our stint back into the city is pretty short-lived this time around. We head back into the club from earlier, with them being grateful for the release of the Metacops. They give us a pass to the Liberty Club. Heading over, we get an amusing jump scare where it seems like we're about to be captured, but it turns out we're just the millionth customer. Drinks on the house. Inside the club, we're given a contact who can get us into Sarcorp. We go to meet them, but before they can get more than a couple words out, one of those lightning-fast police cars zips by and wastes him. We take what we need off his corpse and use it to make our way into Sarcorp. This level is a good time. I would say it's probably the most memorable level in the game for a lot of reasons that we'll get into. Also, this area is the home to the hostile Hmong enemies, short little bald dudes in purple morph suits. They are super satisfying to kill. The place is broken up into distinctly unique areas that we will go through in order. First is the main office complex. While the design leaves a bit to be desired with its somewhat confusing layout, this area is a blast to explore. What appears to be a suite of offices turns out to be riddled with hidden secrets. I spend probably the better part of 40 minutes searching for them all. We find a new power in this search, the pain wave power. This isn't a power I use super frequently, but it essentially sends out a line of electricity through the air. I really enjoy this power, but the downside is it remains in the air for some time after use, often hurting you as much as enemies if you try to collect their Mara. Still a cool spell, though. We also find in our search a good number of tapes, recorded by none other than Montradexter Cat, the leader of the rebellion against Necrom. Turns out he used to work here. The tapes, while a bit direct, are an amazing exposition dump. We pretty well learn all the secrets of the game here. 
The synopsis is that Necrom has been hiding that Sarcorp had first contact with extraterrestrial life, the Sri Feng. These lizard men, previously thought to be mutants, are actually alien life with fantastic magical powers. He describes these powers as innate to the Sri Feng, and trying to describe them is akin to trying to hear the scent of a rose, an expression that I found very profound. These aliens, while apparently helping Sarcorp develop new technologies and powers, are intending to conquer the planet. Necrom, through experimentation, killed himself and was resurrected by a dark light crystal of his own, similar to yourself. Honestly, if it weren't for his god complex and seemingly fanatical desire to kill you, I could almost see siding with Necrom in this narrative. He is practically invincible, but it is revealed that the Sri Fang are working on a device in this very facility capable of destroying him. The Damacron. The device is located further into the compound, so we continue onward. Before reaching the heart of the facility, we come to a room capable of draining our powers completely and we are ambushed. Unfortunately for our would-be assassins, we are very capable of dealing death without magic. Clearing through, we come to the area where the Damacron is stored, and guarding it is a Sri Fang. The exposition dumps on us a bit more, mostly just saying the device is not for us, and then attacks. We take a few hits from the beast, taking his power for ourselves, then remove him from existence. Magic powers or not, heavy blaster fire still does the job. Our new power gained here is Magna Rip. It's a bit of a tactical ability. While not outright killing enemies, it will knock them unconscious for a short period. It's not super useful, but it makes a cool whistle sound. <laughs> Damacron in hand, we need to make our escape. In the hall, we find an emergency weapons cache. It's locked up tight, though. Maybe we need to cause an emergency. Not far away is a disturbingly easy-to-access self-destruct button. Like, to get access to the offices in the building, we had to fight through a turret death trap. But the self-destruct has one short purple dude guarding it? Awful security. They deserve to be destructed. We hit the self-destruct and collect the emergency weapons cache. It contains a, the plasma gun. A big barrel looking thing that shoots big slow moving balls of energy. It's a fun weapon. The big drawback is that you really need to be up in your enemy's face for it to make contact. And it sort of blocks your view. Still, one of the more fun weapons in the game. Gun in hand, we get lost in the escape tunnels for a bit and finally make our way to the exit. Oh, we also raid a lab here for the Icon Incinera, which like the fire icon pyramid from earlier, gives limited access to a specific spell. The spell we get from this one is Nova, an ability capable of making massive fire blasts that can just decimate enemies. The spell has a massive power requirement to cast, but can one-shot all but the most powerful foes. Sadly, once outside, the building doesn't seem to self-destruct. Bit of a letdown. Back in the city, we don't have much else to do here. Now that we have a weapon capable of harming Necrom, and have developed our powers, we need to find him and stop him. We get a tip that Cat can be found in fierce conflict with Necrom in the DMZ, so that is our goal. We take our air car and use it to leave the city for the last time. Once inside the DMZ, we find ourselves under immediate attack by Necrom's mutants, soldiers, artillery, and tanks. This place is a literal war zone. We make good use of our Nova spell. Narratively, there isn't too much to say here. The level is chaos and puts you to the test. Before long, we come across a pitched battle between the Rebels and Necrom's forces. The Rebels are outmatched, but we even the odds and take victory. Inside the Rebel stronghold, we finally meet Cat. He's happy to see us, and lets us know Necrom is here, but unfortunately across a battlefield. A head-on assault would be suicide, so he sends us to infiltrate through the battle to Necrom's base. There is a long section here, fighting through more mutants and tanks. We obliterate them with our Dark Light power, and one awkward window jump later, we find ourselves face to face with Necrom. Well, almost face to face. He's flying above us. I decide that that is super rude, so we turn on our jump jet to get on equal footing. After some posturing, Necrom attacks, and we activate the Damacron. Unfortunately, as we also have a crystal, we are damaged by the feedback along with Necrom. The Damacron isn't strong enough to vanquish Necrom, and he retreats to lick his wounds. Now that the battle is complete, Cat and his rebel warriors show up in droves. Little bit late, guys. Anyhow, Cat lets us know in order to follow Necrom, we're going to have to brave the tunnels, a radiation-soaked death trap full of mutants and unspeakable horrors. Oh, and the rebels won't be coming to help. Great. 
The tunnels. This is an area I both remember with fondness and with dread. This level terrified me as a kid. The second you enter, you hear demons unseen screeching, giant insects chittering, and the unfortunately familiar sounds of genos running amok. Not civilized police genos, but wild, uncultured genos. I can't think of any other game this old that scared me so much, and still today, to a lesser degree, remains unsettling. The new enemies on offer here include the Dragon Bat, a squishy but fast flying monster, the Hell Spider, fast, tanky, and well, a big ass spider. At least one on this map is also randomly like triple health. Returning enemies include the mutated ghouls from earlier on, the ones with the electric powers. And as previously mentioned, Genos, but a mutant version with more health and the ability to cast psychic spells. Between the sound design and the dark locales, this place keeps you on your toes. Oh, and the map finishes with a big maze. In an attempt not to overhype, I will say there is a good amount of platforming in this level, which is not a good thing. In case you've never played a first-person DOS game with platforming, spoiler alert, it sucks. Cyber Mage is especially bad at it. See, in Doom you couldn't jump at all, but you could sort of just launch yourself across gaps if you ran at them quickly. Cyber Mage doesn't allow for this. Instead, you sink like a brick the second a single toe is over the edge of a platform, practically teleporting to the level below. Jump a second late, and you're on the ground. No forgiveness. Compounding this issue, the jump button is shared and only acts as a jump button if you're moving fast enough and in the correct direction, slightly off in your timing and the jump button instead opens up an inventory menu. I have no idea why it's programmed like this. Cyber Mage is a PC only game. There was an entire keyboard to pick from and for some reason they felt the need to make an inventory and jump the same button. Mind boggling. Anyway, I'm going to talk more about controls in my final thoughts, but this is one of my very few gripes with this title. Back to the narrative. Finishing the tunnel maze, we exit into a large open cavern. Coming around the bend, we're greeted with the upsetting visual of dozens of wild mungs waiting. They begin their charge, and we find that they have appeared behind us to flank us. They seem intelligent for what are apparently savage mutants. Once again, perhaps we're the bad guy here. You know, treading onto their ancestral grounds and mercilessly destroying them might be considered problematic. Oh well, kill the savages, I say. We do steal their Luna Light power while we're here, another AoE damaging spell that hangs around once cast, another I don't make too much use of. We exit the burning remains of a destroyed civilization to drop into a crypt. More ghouls await us here. Once dispatched, there is little to stop us from exiting to the next stage, but before leaving, we use our knowledge of obscure 1990s FPS games to locate a secret wall switch. Hitting the switch gives us a key. The key opens a back part of the crypt. Within, we are ambushed by a mass of spiders and ghouls that nearly spell our end. We persevere and are rewarded with 25 to health and to power. Good stuff. Let's move on. Emerging from the underground, we're greeted with a dark garden. Before we can take in the sights, a host of dragon bats are descending upon us. No sooner do we engage in combat with them than a swarm of hell spiders engage us from behind. We emerge from the foliage to the site of a temple rising high, covered in cultists. Hopefully they're friendly. Nope, guess we just have to kill them all. We also find the Earth Mother again here, the purple-robed supernatural being from the start of the game. She warns us that she has a sister. What she is to the light, her sister is to the dark. She lets us know her sister, the Fire Mother, may try to destroy us, and that we are powerless to fight her, but we must find a way to persevere. We can't let her take our Dark Light Crystal. Heavy stuff. On a more comical note, once she finishes speaking to us, she doesn't disappear like last time. She just floats around the stage about eight feet off the ground. You can't hurt her, and she kinda stays out of the way. It's just sort of a funny visual. Anyhow, back to our quest. We infiltrate the cultist base, and soon emerge on the other side. The next area is a mix of the previous two. A forest with some scattered buildings. We meet our first specter here, invisible enemies that cast constant spells on us. The good news is that we gain our last spell from it, Prisma. It creates a massive ball of plasma that hangs in the air and damages all that come near. Super neat looking, but I don't use it much for similar reasons I don't use Pain Wave and Luna Light. Just too much risk of killing myself. We bump back and forth between the buildings, 
We need to burn an offering of dust to get the main temple to open. We find the bag of dust, but it has a habit of vanishing just before you can grab it. Quite a conundrum. What if we find something to replace it, Indiana Jones style? We find a skull to toss on the opposite shelf. This prevents the bag from teleporting away. We grab it and sacrifice it to the Fire Mother idol. This opens up the door to the next area. Within, we find an icon of flight. This does what you would expect. It grants flight. The next room is another standout. It's rife with Necrom's Legion of Dread. Powerful living tanks. At this point in the game, we have gained similar levels of power to Necrom himself. We have flight and can literally throw the sun at our enemies. Clearing the courtyard is really a showcase in how you've grown as a character. From the scared, freshly awakened man you were, scurrying through the sewers to escape Necrom's forces, now you are a human weapon, laying waste to Necrom's most powerful forces outside his seat of power. 10 out of 10 power fantasy. Before entering the main temple and ending the level, we are sadly forced to drop off our flight icon. That's okay, we're perfectly capable of destruction from eye level. The temple is the penultimate level of Cyber Mage, and really brings together everything the game has been building on. Ammo has become scarce, and you're forced to rely almost solely on your powers here. While this would have been a handicap earlier in the game, here it is an advantage. We have a full arsenal of spells and a deep reservoir of power to ensure we can keep up the assault. This level is a labyrinth. Trying to explain the path I took would be a fool's errand, but there are some amazing set pieces here and I'd be doing a disservice to not showcase them. First up, we have a congregation of cultists listening to a sermon from a Shri Fang. Once he finishes speaking, he sends his cultists to destroy me. We wipe out his forces with little effort and make him regret his choices once we make our way up to his balcony. We literally turn him into a yellow puddle on the ground. I don't have much to say about it, but we also slay a group of Shri Fang defending the Dark Light Foil. This is the ultimate melee weapon in the game. Yes, the game has melee weapons. They are awful, including this one. Cool looking though. Moving through the temple, we finally meet the matron of this worship, the Fire Mother. She apparently also wants Necrom destroyed, with the only real reason she gives being that he's ugly. Poor guy. She says some nonsense about joining her, but as I'm a certified good boy, I launch a fireball straight at her head. She doesn't really like that and starts to shoot fireballs of her own. We bravely duck for cover and she eventually gives up saying we'll meet again. Get stuffed, Fire Mother. After wandering for a significant period of time through the temple, we find a trio of Shri Feng who are not hostile. They drop the bomb here that apparently they don't want to conquer Earth. Necrom is wrong, they want to help the Earth. They let us know the Damacron was meant to destroy Necrom, but it wasn't complete when we stole it. Now the only way to defeat him is for us to do it. Now, whether or not we believe the Shri Fang are trying to help, or if they're full of it for the express purpose of saving their asses from Necrom, it doesn't matter. This is a world where people live in destitute slums, killed for the audacity of defending those homes from deranged androids who want to steal their money to gamble with. Money they themselves were probably saving to attempt to gain access to the arena, Mortal Kombat being their one and only way to improve their lot in this world. There are police headquarters actively using mutant creatures and toxic pools for population control. Giant wastelands of mutants and death where the common man can't even walk for fear of becoming a monster themselves. Maybe a reset is in order for this dystopic hellscape. Anyhow, they give us what we need to finish our trip through the temple. We arrive at the chambers of the Fire Mother. She is far more friendly now, saying that she cannot destroy me directly, but that I cannot vanquish Necrom. She gives us some random baubles and lets us know that Necrom awaits us in the Well of Darkness, some sort of facility below the temple. Before leaving, it's worth taking a moment to appreciate the aesthetic here. Looking out the window at the top of the tower, there is a sense of so much dark needing to be overcome. The task seems insurmountable. We descend into the darkness for the final showdown. The showdown with Necrom is one for the ages. Moving into the cyber dungeon that is the Well of Shadows, everything is arrayed against us. There are turrets firing at us from the walls, and Legion of Doom bolster Necrom at every turn. Coming into the battle with Necrom, we find he is untouchable. Even our Damacron has lost all efficacy, only harming us now. We see the manifestation of the Mang, the Dark, in the center of the room. Only one thing can vanquish that Dark. Us. We physically throw ourselves into the Dark Spirit, our very essence reducing and weakening it. Before long, the Mang is gone and Necrom is vulnerable. 
He teleports away, and we play a bit of cat and mouse with him and his remaining Legion of Doom. Before long, we're back in the center arena to end things. He talks a big game, but a few dozen hover bombs, a few magic explosions, and some good old-fashioned blaster fire send Necrom to the grave for the second and last time. Following his defeat, his dark light crystal vanishes, and we are teleported out to be treated to one final cinematic. In the end, Cat is awaiting us with the Shry Fang. He explains that they were on our side the whole time. I guess them trying to blow me away was just a misunderstanding. Glossing past that, Cat explains there is a fear that I could turn to the dark just like Necrom, and will have to work hard to stay in the light. The Shry Feng inform us that Necrom's crystal was destroyed, and that I hold the last one ever made. Apparently all the research that created it was also destroyed. Cutting away to a new location, we see the crystal on a table. We've been deceived. The Earth Mother is there. She reaches a hand to take the crystal, but is intercepted by the Fire Mother. And here is where the credits roll, and unfortunately, where the story ends forever. Cyber Mage was an FPS RPG that was before its time. It meshed so many genres like never before. It combined magic with advanced sci-fi weaponry, combined story-driven narrative with action-heavy shooter gameplay, combined 3D graphics with 2D comics. This game was unlike anything else at the time. And it feels like in another universe, where this picked up the traction it deserved, it could have been the Half-Life before Half-Life. The soundtrack is on point the entire game, and the voice acting, for the most part, is a good quality. The graphical look is in that interesting time between 2D and 3D, and I think Cyber Mage walks that fine line between the two amazingly well. Though I will admit I can understand how someone may not have the same appreciation I do. All that said, I'm obviously a massive fan of this game, but it did have its issues. The biggest problem with this title is the controls. Even for its time, the game was a mess to control. Movement is through the arrow keys, space fires, insert crouches, control is somehow both jump and inventory. Inventory is further subdivided. F1 pulls up weapons, F2 pulls up powers, F3 opens key items. Look up and look down is Q and E, and the controls further complicate in flight or in a vehicle, where you now add a vertical up and down using W and X respectively. All of this to say, there is a bit of a learning curve to the controls here. Additionally, the game has a bit of a difficulty curve, which likely scared a lot of new players off. You start with very low stats, and unfortunately the only way to increase those stats is to get in close with the enemy and absorb their Mara. You can see how this could be a problem when health is limited and you are learning a difficult control scheme. Where you might want to hang back and take enemies safely while you become proficient, the game will punish you for this with less stat increases. There are limited enemies in this game. You cannot grind levels later to make up for what you've missed. If you miss Mara at the start, you'll be weaker at the end of the game. I do still have a fondness for this system regardless. See, despite the difficult start, this game does have good pacing if you look at it from a whole game perspective. You're supposed to be weak at the start, just learning to use your powers. You lean on weapons and agility to stay alive in the early hours. Later in the game, there's a nearly seamless transition where the ammo starts to dry up, but your powers have developed to the point where they're more powerful anyway. You don't miss your old crutch. You don't need to avoid enemies anymore. They need to avoid you. I think this is a really nuanced thing for any game to get just right, and I do think Cyber Mage is 90% there, with maybe the first level being a touch overtuned. If I've piqued your interest, this game can be played today if you can find the files and have experience with DOSBox. I had one crash throughout my entire playthrough, so stability wasn't an issue. It weirdly played in a stretched aspect, but my recording looks to be in the proper visual aspect. Oh well, better for you all to look at I suppose. All in all, while I have a massive fondness for this title, so much of that comes from playing it in the time that I did. It just had something I had never seen in games prior. It had a soul and a uniqueness that to me has never been matched. Playing through for your first time now would not likely have the same effect on a new audience. Mantra Dexter Cat has an expression that I think fits well here. Trying to explain why this title is so special to a modern audience is akin to trying to hear the scent of a rose. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try. See you in the next video.